Excellent. Well, welcome to this revision session for the AAT Level 3 Advanced Synoptic. My name is Ben Bullman. If you don't know me, I am a full-time tutor and one of the directors at First Intuition. I actually manage the Cambridge and Peterborough centres, but I also help my colleagues in our distance learning team teaching students remotely across the country and actually across the whole world. You are very welcome joining our session. This is really to help you to prepare for the synoptic assessment at level three. In this session, we're going to do a few things. In a moment, I've got three mini quiz questions that we will do as a bit of an interactive exercise or you can just play along at home watching and see if you come up with the right answer. So I will share those on the screen in a moment. I will then bring up Excel. I have got three mini tasks this evening that we're gonna have a look at. They're not directly in the assessment format, but hopefully they will be a good recap of some of the core techniques needed from the advanced bookkeeping, the final accounts preparation, and the management account costing units that are all retestable knowledge in the level three synoptic. A question I've actually had from a student this week is any of the indirect tax knowledge tested? And I can confirm no. Currently in the AAT syllabus, the indirect tax unit, although it's a level three unit, the knowledge from that is not required and retested in the level three synoptic. So we will be recapping some of the core technique areas from advanced bookkeeping, final accounts preparation and management account costing. Right, shall we start then with a mini quiz to get us warmed up? Three short answer questions. If you are joining me live this evening, you can play along by clicking the screen in a moment when I share it. But if you're watching back on the recording, don't worry, you can still make a note of your answer. And then we will have a bit of discussion in a moment about which one was the right answer. So first one for me to share with you. And hopefully on the screen, you have now got your question one for this evening. You work for a firm of accountants. You suspect a client has concealed the proceeds of tax evasion. Who should you report this to? If I could ask you to select an answer on the screen, you've got one of four choices. Would you report it to the client themselves that they are evading tax? Would you report it to the police? Bearing in mind tax evasion is a crime in itself. Would you report it to your firm's MRL? sorry, MLRO, which stands for Money Laundering Reporting Officer, or would you report it to Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, bearing in mind they are the authority that regulate tax within the United Kingdom? For anyone that's playing along at home, I will give you another 10 seconds. If you haven't selected an answer, please do so, and then I will be able to share with you the results of this one and we can have a chat about which one is the right answer and the one you would need to be including within your um, assessment. Yeah, it is a bit like fastest finger first on who wants a millionaire, isn't it? Right, I'm gonna end that one and I can now share with you the results of this evening's first question. So 83% of the audience this evening selected, and I have to say that was the right answer, your firm's money laundering reporting officer. But let's just talk through the four available options. Who can remind me why we wouldn't report any concealment of proceeds of crime to the client? What might we be inadvertently doing? And Sarah was quick in the chat box and others are now joining in. Yes, we can't report any suspicion of money laundering or concealment of proceeds of crime to the client because that would be tipping them off, which in itself is a legal activity because it would mean they could conceal and destroy evidence that would mean the 
the investigation would not lead anywhere. So we don't want to report it to the client if it's tax evasion. The police, although tax evasion is a crime, we wouldn't report it directly to the police ourselves if we work for a practice firm of chartered accountants because, and as 83% of you this evening playing along at home have told me, we should have as a firm of accountants, a designated money laundering reporting officer. It would be our responsibility to report it to them. And that individual would then report it on behalf of the firm to the National Crime Agency. So give yourselves a pat on the back if you said, report to your firm's money laundering reporting officer. Finally, at the bottom, Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs, and this is the one that does catch students out, and 14% of you this evening said report to them. The issue we've got is because concealment of the proceeds of crime is actually covered under the money laundering regulation and the proceeds of crime act, the protocol is it gets reported directly to the money laundering reporting officer and then onto the national crime agency. And there is no requirement or responsibility to report tax evasion to her Majesty's Revenue and Customs because it's a criminal matter and criminal investigations would be done by the National Crime Agency. Excellent. So hopefully if you didn't get that one right, you've now seen and understood where it came from. OK, let's go with the next one for this evening. So I've got a second question to share with you. If you bear with me one second. I will launch the second question on the screen. So a bit like who wants to be a millionaire again, fastest finger first, or if you're watching the recording, you can just note down your answer, but have a go at this one. So this time it's monthly management account time and your department is showing a poor result. Your manager has asked you to falsely increase the revenue with some fake sales invoices. If you enter these, which ethical principle would you be breaking? So same, you've got four options. One of those is the right answer, but we will talk through all four of them just to say why we can rule out the others. I will give everybody, if you are playing along at home, another 20 seconds to make your selection. So are you saying this would be a breach of confidentiality? Are you saying a breach of integrity? Are you saying a breach of professional competence and due care? Or are you saying a breach of objectivity? Last five seconds for anyone that hasn't selected. As I say, if you are watching the recording or you don't want to select one, you can just make a note because I can now share with you and I wonder if it's the same students that got the last answer correct, because this evening, if I share the results, we have had 81% of the audience get that question correct. The correct answer is integrity. Integrity all about being open, honest, not falsifying any information or documents or covering up problems. And clearly, if you are falsifying the management accounts by putting through fake sales, that would be a breach of your integrity. But let's just have a quick chat with regards to why I would be ruling out the others. No one selected confidentiality, and that is very correct. Confidentiality all about sharing information to people that shouldn't have access to it. And that would not be relevant in this scenario. It clearly is relevant in other exam scenarios. So, so make sure you understand confidentiality, but not for this one. We've just said integrity is the one that I would want you talking about or selecting for this one. Integrity all about being honest, not concealing bad information, not falsifying things. But then the bottom two, professional competence and due care, and I've got some sympathy, actually, with the 11% of the audience that went for that one. Um, professional competence, all about skills. Are you or have you got the skills and experience needed? 
Now here it doesn't talk specifically about not having the skills. I think you know quite correctly that these are fake sales invoices and this would not be in accordance with anything that you've been trained to do. So I don't think it's a lack of your ability. Due care, the second element to that one is all about a lack of time potentially to do the best job. And it doesn't look like here you're under time pressure to rush. So I can see why maybe 11% went for it, but anything to do with falsifying that word fake sales invoices, fudging the numbers, that's going to be integrity. And then the final one, objectivity. Objectivity is all about bringing in any kind of personal bias. Now, again, in some scenarios similar to this, that one might also be relevant if it mentions that your department stand to get some kind of reward or bonus for hitting a profit target, then I could stretch this one out to be objectivity as well, because any financial benefit you're going to get from the results would make you more biased to a particular way of doing it. But without that being mentioned, the one I'm pleased that 81% of you went for was integrity. OK, I'm going to stop sharing the results for that one. And I'm just going to launch our final poll question for this evening before we move on and start looking at some of the spreadsheet tasks that I've got lined up. So the final one, and I'm going to launch this on your screen now. So as the same as the others, if you are watching the recording, just play along and make a note. But if you're watching me live this evening, you should on your screen now be able to select one of four potential answers for this one. Which accounting concept supports taking a cautious approach, for example, making a provision for doubtful debts? So if you are being cautious in your reporting in your work, which of the concepts would you be supporting? So a provision for doubtful debts, 50-50 a lot of people are saying, um, well only one of them is the answer I am hoping for, so make your mind up, I'll give you another 10 seconds or so, if you haven't selected, are you going this evening for accruals concept, are you going for prudence concept, are you going for the going concern concept, or are you going for faithful representation? I can see the answers that you're giving. I can't see who's giving them, but I can see the bars in advance of me sharing them. And this one is a bit closer, actually. So this one's been a bit more of a challenge for you. Final five seconds to make your mind up if you haven't selected. And if you're playing along, watching the recording, decide which one you would go for. Because at this stage, I can now end the poll. And that gives me the facility to share on the screen the result from it. So the result from this one, and 64% of the audience this evening were correct. The prudence concept is all about being cautious. If you are being prudent, you may be making provisions against something, showing a, a slightly worst case scenario. So providing for doubtful debts would be the prudence concept in evidence. So well done if you said prudence, you would be correct. The accruals concept all about matching, matching the income and expenditure in the correct period. So I can see why you might have thought about what well, was the bad debt expense talking about accruals, but save that one more for accruals adjustments, prepayment adjustments at month end and depreciation also is another example of accruals matching the expense in the period that, that the use of the asset relates. Not really relevant for bad debts and doubtful debts in this one. Going concern, going concern concept all about the company's ability to continue to trade. And so any disclosure in a set of financial statements around any concerns around that would be required. But going concern all about that continuing to trade for the foreseeable future. And then faithful representation, all about really the directors or the responsible people preparing the accounts making sure that they faithfully represent the facts and the substance of transactions. But if you get a question around provision for doubtful debts, I would be looking to talk and include in your answer the prudence concept as your main point. Um, 
Inventory valuation, Ruth, I can see in the chat box has just asked. Yeah, inventory valuation is also prudence because we value inventory at the lower of cost and net realizable value. So by bringing down that to the lowest, we are being prudent. So fantastic. Yes, well done. Right, I'm going to stop sharing those results with you now. Okay. The session has begun. It did start at seven o'clock this evening. So welcome for joining. If you're watching the recording, you are also very welcome to our session this evening. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for a second because I need to share another screen with you. So bear with me one tick while I change the way it looks. Hopefully I can now share Excel with you. So as if by magic on the screen, you can now see what I see. Um, you can see with regards to the spreadsheet that hopefully most of you have received in advance of this evening. If you haven't done, it's not the end of the world. Don't worry. You can still follow along on the screen with what I am going to do and hopefully explain to you. Now, as you can see, the first thing I have to caveat is these are not AAT direct assessment tasks. These are not sample assessments that have been released by the AAT. They are things that we produce at First Intuition. I've actually produced these myself for when I've been teaching advanced synoptic level three in the classroom. They do not try to directly replicate the tasks you will get in the assessment but they do give us a good chance to recap some of the core areas of advanced bookkeeping, final accounts preparation, and management accounting costing. They also give us a chance to just familiarize ourselves with some of the spreadsheet terminology, some of the places to go, and some of the ways we might need to use the spreadsheet and Excel software in our assessment. So I'm hoping they will be a constructive use of your time and the study session that we are going to undertake together. Right, a bit of terminology to start with. So these three tabs, as you might call them, at the bottom of the screen here, but the assessment is likely to call them worksheets. So when the exam and the assessor talks about using a separate worksheet, this is what they're talking about. And I've got three lined up for you this evening. We've got a worksheet that covers off some advanced bookkeeping style task area. We've got a worksheet that covers final accounts preparation. And we've got a worksheet that recaps some of the techniques needed from management accounting costing. If the assessor talks about a workbook, that is the whole file that these are contained with. So make sure you know if the assessor says save the workbook and call it this, that is the file, the whole Excel file. If they say start or open a new worksheet, they are talking about one of these tabs at the bottom that I can flick between all within the same workbook. Right, so we're going to start on the first worksheet, which is the task covering some advanced bookkeeping knowledge this evening. So I've called this task number one for this evening. Remember, this is not directly in the style that the spreadsheet task will look in the assessment, but it will give us a good chance to familiarize ourselves with some advanced bookkeeping and also some Excel features that might be useful for your synoptic preparation. So we are presented with a screen and a worksheet that says the following trial balance has been extracted for Collie B Limited for the year end 31st of March 17. Now there's really two things from that opening sentence that I like students to have a look at and focus on. The first thing is, and I'm just going to highlight it on the screen for you now, so I'm going to use the fill function. I've not been asked to do this in the assessment, but I'm just going to do it for demonstration purposes. The bit of the screen that I've just turned yellow is the trial balance they are referring to. I hope at this stage of your studies, you are familiar with a trial balance. So every trial balance will have a debit column and every trial balance will have a credit column. And as the name suggests, we hope when we get to the bottom of the trial balance, the debits in total equal the credits. And here you can see that we have done. 
On the very left hand side in the first column of our spreadsheet, we have got the names and these names would correspond if you think back to your bookkeeping knowledge to nominal ledger accounts within the books and records and the nominal ledger of the business. So I'm not going to go through them one by one, but you can see we've got a, a balance for accruals and prepayments, although there's a zero balance on those at the moment. And then we've got some expenses, we've got some income and we've got some other accounts there. You will also notice we have got a suspense account. In the assessment, if you're presented with a suspense account, it's likely by the end you want the balance on your suspense to have come back to zero because that would show we've put through an adjustment that has cleared the suspense and maybe corrected a prior error that has been made. So the first thing in that sentence is a trial balance and hopefully you are all familiar with that concept. The second thing that's worth just identifying, and I would suggest you do this in any accounting task, not just at level three synoptic, but in all of your assessments, identify the period end that you are working for the business towards. And so the period here is 31st of March 17. It doesn't really matter what that period end is, but it's a good point of reference maybe for some of the potential adjustments that you might need to consider. OK, if we then move down the screen, so I'm just hitting the, the, the down arrow on my cursor on the keyboard to move the spreadsheet down. Further down in row 22, I have got some requirements and it says record the adjustments for the following. And then beneath it here, I have got text that says phone expense of £740 were invoiced to the business in April 17. The calls relate to the month of March 17. So three important bits of information there. The amount of the expense is 740. It relates to telephone and then the dates. The business was invoiced for these in April 17, but the calls related to the month of March 17. So if we go back up, we've been told our year end is to the end of March. This expense clearly relates for the period that we are talking about, but they were invoiced to the business in April. I'll give you a couple of seconds at home. What kind of adjustment would I be looking to make if I've got an expense that's been invoiced after the period, but relates to the reporting period I am preparing? Brilliant. This is going to be an accrual adjustment, and therefore we are applying the accruals concept, the matching concept of now trying to match up this 740. Now it says it all related to the month of March, so I need to record the whole of the 740 as an expense in this period. So hopefully you remember to increase my expense, and this is telephone expenses, I would need to debit. So you can see here in my trial balance, I've now got a column next door to adjust either debit or adjust either credit, and I need to put through 740 that I enter in the debit adjustment for phone expense. And in my accruals, I'm going to enter the credit for the accrual adjustment. Accruals are a kind of liability of the business, 740 pounds there. And you can see that my debit equals my credit for the adjustments. So hopefully we're all happy with the first adjustment for our accrual. The next adjustment, so looking down two rows, it says insurance was paid on the 1st of January 17 for an annual premium. The amount paid was £2,400. Now, we have paid an annual premium that presumably starts in January, but again, going back to our reference point of our year end, our year end finishes on the 31st of March. So if I am doing my maths, and this is where I love to watch students in my exam centre doing assessments, because I'll see them get their fingers out and start counting, and I think, brilliant, those guys are hopefully not going to be caught out by numbers of months. We've got January, February and March that relate to our year, 
But equally, we have got the remaining months of March through to, sorry, April through to December that don't. I am therefore expecting prepayments to be nine of those 12 months. Does that make sense, everybody? From April through to December of that annual premium, we need to prepay. So this is where we're going to have to do a bit of a calculation. Now, I haven't been asked to do this in the spreadsheet, but we might as well use a simple spreadsheet calculation to do it. So the 2,400, I'm then just going to divide it by 12 and times it by nine. And you can see me entering that in the cell there. Well done if you are screaming at me, 1,800 pounds of prepayment. So a prepayment adjustment is that the opposite really of the accrual adjustment we just made. This time we need to reduce the relevant expense because at the moment we have recorded too much. So to reduce my insurance expense, I need to credit there with the 1,800, the prepayment adjustment. That's going to bring down my insurance expense this year. And I'm going to carry it as a prepayment, which is a debit. A prepayment is an asset. That's something that's actually going to be worth something to the business next year when we release it back and get the benefit of that insurance cover that we have paid in advance. So we would have um, 1,800, 1,800. Now, I've done that calculation just for my own reference. It wouldn't hurt in the assessment if you left your calculation in there. The more detail you can give to the marker, the better. So, hey, ho, I'm going to leave it but you didn't have to, it wasn't actually required. You could have done your calculation in the cell for the prepayment actually thinking about it. But I would get into the habit of leaving as much detail around in your spreadsheets as possible. The more you can leave on your sheet, the more the assessor's got to have a look at when they mark it. So I would leave it there personally and show full transparency for what you have done. Cool, so that's dealt with our second adjustment. We've now got a third adjustment here, so I'm scrolling down again. An amount taken out by the owner was misposted to wages. The amount taken out of the bank account was 2,000. So hopefully you can all scream at home and tell me an amount taken out by the owner of the business is called what? What do we call something taken out by the owner? Drawings, I hope you are all shouting. Fantastic if you are saying drawings at home. So we've got an error in our trial balance at the moment. The amount has been misposted to wages. Well, the owner doesn't take wages. We have to reclassify this as drawings. The amount we've got to correct is 2,000. So at the moment, they have put too much to wages expense. I now need to find wages and go and put through an adjustment to credit there with the 2000. That's going to reduce the wages expense. But on the other side, I need to go and correctly debit the drawings account to reclassify it. So I've credited wages to remove the expense that was posted there in error. And I have debited drawings with the 2000 to go and reflect it there. And again, always worth checking with any adjustments that my debits at this stage still equal my credits. They do. So this is looking promising for my adjustments. My fourth and final adjustment for this one, a new employee started in the year. Payments to her were not identified as wages by the previous bookkeeper and were posted to suspense. Well, brilliant, because I said, we want to get to a position at the end of an adjustment task that we have cleared our suspense account. So at the moment, we have got 3,200 sitting there in the debit column. So if you're playing along at home, you can shout out, what have I got to do to suspense to now bring that balance back to zero as I want it to be when I present my final trial balance? I want it to be 3,200 credit adjustment because that's going to offset the debit that's already sitting there. Now we know in the world of accountancy, whatever I credit, I need to go and put an equal and opposite debit somewhere else. I refer back to the particular error that was made. A new employee started, 
payments to her were not identified as wages, but they should have been. So I need to go to my wages account and find the line for that one in my extended trial balance and go and record a 3,200 debit entry there. Now that's really good because again, I can double check my adjustment debits in total equal my adjustment credits. I won't know for certain that I put them in the right line here and to the right nominal accounts, but it's a positive sign that just gives me that bit of confidence and reassurance. So I've now done part one. Part two then at the bottom here says, calculate the final balances on each account and produce a final trial balance column. Use a sum formula to confirm it balances. So we'd already got in our template the final column and I need to ascertain the final debit or credit balance on each of these accounts. So if I'm working across my original trial balance, the bit I've now got in yellow had no balance on accruals, we put an adjustment of credit 7400. So my final balance, and I can either just type in 7400 or if I'm being clever showing off in Excel, I could say equals my credit adjustment there. Whichever way you do it, at this stage it doesn't matter because we weren't asked for a specific formula to do it, but I've got 740 as my answer. I'm going to try and use the Excel functionality as much as possible to show off how you can use this. So for the next line, we started with no balance on prepayments. We then had got a debit adjustment of 1,800. So I'm going to put an equals that debit adjustment there to say my final balance needs to be 1,800. Phone expense line, this one a bit more complex, my final balance, because we started with 2,400 debit. We've then got 740 as a debit adjustment. So I'm going to do equals the original debit plus the adjustment debit should give you a final debit balance of 3140. Um, I would use as much formula function as possible in the exam. The more you can show off your Excel skills, the more the assessors got to mark. So I would do as much of this using formulas as you possibly can do. But in the assessment, there will be some functions that you are asked specifically to use. So if you then just hard key in numbers, you will actually drop marks in those. So I would use as much of the formula function as you can do. Insurance expense next. So this is now getting quite boring for me, but I need to continue. Debit adjustment, but hold on a second. This is now slightly more confusing because our adjustment was a credit. So that is surely going to bring down the original debit balance we have done. I'm going to signify that by deducting the credit entry and I get 2,200 as my final balance on insurance expense, having credited my adjustment of 1,800. Sales is really straightforward because there's been no adjustment, so I can just extract the original balance. The same with the bank debit balance there. So we've got balance debit with the bank. The drawings, I've got the original Plus, I'm going to add on the debit adjustment column to get my new balance there. Wages is going to be a bit fiddly. I've got an original debit balance. I'm then going to add on our adjustment debit, but deduct and put in a minus for the adjustment credit. And if you're playing along at home, hopefully you've got 13,200 as your final debit balance. Suspense, as we said, in an ideal world, will always come back to zero because we've been asked to clear it. But capital needs to remain and I want my final credit balance on capital. Now, the final one said use a sum formula to confirm it balances. So the totals at the bottom here have been left blank. I'm just going to use my mouse to click. And I need to find the sum formula, which hopefully you can find as the funny little indicator. If you've got the screen on full display, you can see the little Greek sum sign. Looks like a funny kind of squiggly, almost like a reverse Z. So I can find that. I would always use these functions at the top up here in Excel. So if this is the formula 
I need to use the sum function. I can hit that. It's automatically tried to sum across. Now Excel tries to predict what you might want to do. I need to change that because I need to sum up the column above. So I'm just gonna hold my mouse and drag down while I'm still in that formula sum. So this is where there are multiple ways in Excel you can get exactly the same function and feature into your formula. I've done it by using the funny little sum symbol. If you can't find that, you can just type into the cell equals sum and then open brackets and use the reference for the cells that you want. So it's selected G9, which is G9, the top of the column. Then we've got a uh, uh, dot dot to G18, the bottom one. If I hit return, it's done it for me. If you're really struggling, another way, and this is a really good tip for any formula or function that you can't recall. If I go to the formulas menu at the top, so I'm going to do the, the sum in the, the column H for the credit column. If I go to formulas, I've got, there we go again, the auto sums there. But if you ever get asked for a formula or a function and you just can't recall how to do it, you are allowed to use all of the help features Excel has got. There is this insert function here. And if you get a function and a formula, hopefully you're all going to be familiar with sum. But if you get something else that you can't recall, and let's imagine I had a complete mind blank and couldn't remember sum. If I hit equal sum there, it's even going to give me a bit of a, a prompt guide of how to do a sum formula. So sum, I can then choose what do I want it to sum up. So I can say sum up. And then hopefully it's going to give us that range. This time we're in column H. And if I hit OK, it's done it for me. There are multiple ways. This is why with Excel, you need to put in a bit of time for yourselves to familiarize it because there are multiple ways and it doesn't matter how you get to the right answer because all they're going to see when this now gets submitted is the equal sum H9 to H18 and it really doesn't matter how we've got there. But that's it. What am I hoping for at the end? Well, I'm hoping that the total of my final debits equals the total of my credits. I don't know whether I've got this task completely right, but I've got a bit of confidence to say, well, I submitted it with a final trial balance that balanced. So with, with a bit of luck, I'm going to get some, some good credit for that. Excellent. That's the first of our, our task. So um, that's the first of, of our tasks for this evening. And hopefully you have found that one useful. Second one then. So I'm going to now click across to the next worksheet. Um, I'm just being asked in the chat box. Yeah, the assessment venues all will have their own versions of Excel. So it's well worth you asking your assessment venue in advance of your exam, which version of Excel they have got loaded on their computers, because that's the one you'll be using. Um, they look slightly different. And I know students get panicked if they're presented on the day with something that looks slightly different. But they are very, very similar when you are using them. So um, when, when you're moving around, hopefully you can get back to some familiar stuff, whether you use the top. This one is nice. So this is a version of Office 365 that's got a really nice search function at the top. So if you can't find something such as sum, you type it there, it's going to give you some guidance. You can use all of those features in the assessment. So don't sit there and struggle. They're trying to replicate what it might be like for you guys in a workplace environment. And... Um, not everybody knows all of the functions of Excel off the top of their head, but they can maybe use the, the, the functionality within Excel to guide them. The kind of wizards, the on-screen help function is something that you can certainly use. Right, task two. So this worksheet looking at some final accounts preparation stuff. So what have we been asked to do here? Again, this is not directly in the format of the assessment, but it's going to give us a chance to use Excel to look at some of the features there and also to recap some of the prior knowledge from the, the, the units that you need to know going into your synoptic assessment. So it says prepare the profit and loss, the P&L for Marvin Limited for the year end of 31st of the 12th 17 using the trial balance details at the bottom of this sheet. 
Then we're asked to use a fill color to make the gross and pr net profit sales yellow. And then it says use an if formula to write OK if sell H24 when profit is more than 12,000 or write warning if profit is less than 12,000. Right. We've been given a bit of a template for um, statement of P&L, but, but you can insert rows if you want to. I think looking at it, cost of sales is maybe going to get a bit congested. So I'm going to insert a, a row there. Just to remind you, I'm going to do this. I'm selecting the row that I want to insert above or below. I've right clicked on it with the mouse. I'm hitting insert, insert entire row, and it's now pinged me in another row so I can do a full breakdown of cost of sales. Make sure you present your spreadsheets looking nice. Aside from the functionality of Excel, the other thing the assessor's looking for is, if this was a workplace task, has the student produced a spreadsheet that looks nice? It's, it's spaced out in a way that, that can be understood and read. So don't squash everything into the cells in the top corner. Spread stuff out. Obviously, if they ask you to enter something in a specific cell, make sure you follow their guidance on that. And we'll see that with the if formula in a minute. But let's get back to the part number one of this task. We've got to prepare this profit and loss. Now, they've given us a good start by thinking about revenue. Another word for sales, everybody. Cost of sales. I hope at this stage of your studies, you can either roll this straight off the tongue or you've got a post-it note up on your fridge that says cost of sales in your assessment will invariably be opening inventory. So I'm just going to type this in so I can remember. Plus the purchases expense. Minus the closing inventory. And really, you need to be able to recall that so you know. I can also see that it's making those bold. Now, I haven't been asked to do any formatting, but I want to make it look nice and presentable. And so I would probably say I don't want those being bold. I'm therefore going to highlight those three cells. I'm going to go back here home and I'm going to unselect bold for those to make them just in, in normal type. So, so keep an eye on your presentation, please. And remember, if they are specifically for things like make it this font, make it this size, make it bold or italics, follow those instructions to the letter because they are looking for your ability to follow those instructions and demonstrate your, your skills to do so. Right. We've then got a heading underneath for expenses. And then we've got net profit. Remember, gross profit is just sales, less cost of sales. Net profit also deducts the other overhead expenses. Now, I've thrown you a bit of a curveball underneath in the trial balance because not all of these are things that would find themselves on the profit and loss account. Machinery cost is an asset. So that's going to go to a statement of financial position. We can ignore that. Likewise, accumulated depreciation that reduces the net book value of the asset. So that's not relevant for the P&L. Um, accruals, again, that goes on our statement of financial position. That's a liability. Likewise, with trade receivables, that's an asset. So is stock asset. So is the bank. So is payables. Capital and drawings come through the, um, the, the, the capital, the current account. So, so they're not going to be included. And it's really here we start with our first number, sales. So sales is another word for revenue and income. However you want to do this for yourself is fine, but make sure you pick up the right numbers. So I'm going to put in revenue and select equals here. And then I'm going to extract the number directly from the trial balance. So I'm going to select sales and press enter. And then you can see it's put the number in there. Um, could hard key them in. But if, if, if you make silly mistakes, you are going to be penalized. Right. Then we have got our cost of sales. So I'm now looking for our opening inventory number. I'm going to put this slightly to the side because we're going to subtotal this number in a moment to come up with total cost of sales. But we can see opening inventory or opening stock is 6,000. So I'm going to extract that number. I'm then looking for purchases number. So I'm going to find our purchases number and that's there, 38,000. So I'm going to include that. What do I have to do with closing stock to calculate cost of sales? I'm going to add together in a minute opening plus purchases, but we're going to deduct closing stock. 
So if I wanted to make this look really cool, I could actually input that as a minus number by selecting closing stock. And you can see it's put it up there as a minus um, 9,600. That means I can now do a subtotal of cost of sales. So again, using some of my functionality, I can do a simple sum formula that adds up or sums up the opening plus the purchases minus my closing only because I've made that a minus number or you could have put in a formula that says equals opening plus purchases minus closing. Don't care how you do it, but I want you to come up with 34,400 for your cost of sales. And I could include that as a, a line if I wanted to cost of sales. And I might even then insert another row just to make this spaced out even more. Really just make sure it looks nice on the screen. Gross profit then is as simple as taking your sales revenue number and deducting from it your cost of sales number. So you should have come up with gross profit of 41,900. Um, doesn't matter unless you're asked for it. Rachel's asking, does it matter if you put cost of sales in the column with the pound sign as well? That doesn't matter. If you're asked to include pound signs, please do. If you're asked to show it in a particular way, please follow. If not, apply your own judgment, really. Apply your own judgment to, to how you, you present it. But try and make it look nice. Try and present it in a way you would be happy submitting this to your manager um, and, and try and make the assessor proud of your skills right that's got us the gross profit number then we've got a, a line underneath that says less expenses so in our tb we've also got some other expenses some of the kind of more overheady expenses so all i'm going to do to simplify this you can do this for text as well as for numbers i'm just going to put in an equals and then it should replicate the telephone expenses i'm going to put in an equals and it's going to replicate the wages expenses I'm going to put in an equals and it's just going to copy up whatever we've got contained in the next expense line, which is bad debt expenses. I'm going to do the same again for equals and I'm going to put in the electricity expenses. And then the final one is depreciation. I'm presuming because that's a debit balance and we've already had accumulated depreciation at the top, that depreciation is also depreciation expense. So they are my expenses. They've come through as bold. So I'm going to just unbold those so that they just look consistent with the rest of it. I wasn't told to do that, but I think it looks better. And then at this stage, I just need to extract the numbers. So in a similar way, and please just take a bit of time here to pull through the right numbers. I'm going to put through an equals and pull through the number for telephone expenses. I'm going to put an equals and pull through the number for wages expenses. Um, for anyone that's really sophisticated with Excel, because those cells follow on in order, I could now actually just select. And if you ever want to copy a cell down quickly, if I just hover my mouse on the cell, I get a little plus arrow. You see the black plus arrow that I've got there? Not that white plus arrow, but in the bottom right corner, I can now hold my mouse down, drag it. And it will actually copy that formula. But because I haven't made it a, a fixed cell reference by using that fancy dollar sign, if you remember that from your Excel studies, I can copy it down and it will then continue to copy down the cell references beneath it. Worth double checking that's worked. So if it has worked, the bad debts are 3,400. Well, that looks good. The electricity, 8,000 and the depreciation, 2,400. Fantastic. Now I can subtotal those again, so I can maybe do an, an underline at some point if I wanted to there to say this is a subtotal. doesn't really matter, but I'm going to use my good old friend the sum formula to total up those five cells to get the total of those expenses. And then to work out my net profit, I'm going to take my gross profit that I'd already calculated, so that's up there in F21. And I'm going to deduct the sum of those expenses. Could have done it one by one and not shown the subtotal. It really doesn't matter. Just go with what you are comfortable with. But stress again, make it look nice and presentable for the assessor. And I have got a net profit of 7,100. If you've played along at home and crunched the numbers, did anyone else get 7,100? Um, brilliant. Happy days if you've got 7,100. I am human like you guys, and I'm prone to making silly mistakes, so it's reassuring for me to know I got it. 
in the assessment, it's not always about getting the right answer. It's about actually doing what they've asked for and following the process. So stage two says use the fill color to make gross and net profit yellow. So fill, few ways you can get to good old fill. I can either right click and use the kind of cell format here. So for those of you that like doing it that way, I can find um, format cells and then pick in there fill and choose the yellow and hit OK. Or you can see at the top here, you've got the paint bucket that's being upturned. That's the cell fill. So I'll do it that way for the net profit cell. And I can just select the net profit cell and then go up there and hit fill. I can select a little drop down to change the colors, but it's already defaulted to yellow. So I can do that. Please, with things like that, I know they sound quite simple, but they will pick up marks in the assessment that are crucial marks. So follow the instructions. We were told to make the fill for gross and net profit yellow. So don't choose a different color. Don't choose a different cell. That's really simple marks for just doing as you have been told in the assessment. Right, final bit, and this is a bit more technical with regards to some of the functionality and formulas within Excel. It says use an if formula to write OK in cell H24 when profit is more than 12,000 or write warning if profit is less than 12,000. Now, if formulas are great because if formulas, we can tell Excel to say if this happens, do this. If this doesn't happen, do this. But if you're really, really nervous on the day of the assessment and you think, crikey, I can't remember. I know I've done if formulas, but I can't remember how to do them. I would use the Excel functionality to help you. First of all, make sure you do what you are told. We've been asked to do this in cell H24. So we find column H, we find row 24. And I don't know why they've picked that cell, but please follow the instructions. So that's where in this cell here, the one I've now got my mouse hovering on, I need to put in my if formula. Now, if I'm honest with you, I couldn't remember off the top of my head how to type out the full cell text for an if formula. But I do know I've always got my old friend up here, the formulas drop down menu. I can go to this natty insert function and I can then type if in the little insert function box that I've got on the screen and hit go. Now what Excel does is bring up all of the functions that are similar. And the first one I've got is the if formula I need, but you can do that for others. You can do that for average. You can do that for sums. You can do that for any formula function you're asked for if you are panicking about it. Right, so we've been asked for the if formula. I'm gonna hit okay. And then you get a nice little help guide. So this is where it says the logical test. Now the logical test is what we need this to be. So we were asked to say if the net profit is going to be, and this is where you just need to allow yourself a bit of time because while I've been talking, I've forgotten exactly what it was going to, to talk about. So I'm just gonna cancel out of that and go back up to make sure I'm gonna do this correctly for you. It says when the profit is more than 12,000, right? Let's go back to H24 then, and I'm going to do it all again. Insert function, hit if, select go, it's found it. I'm going to hit OK. So the logical test is if, and this was the net profit, is greater than, and you can use the nice little um, greater than formula here, the little pointy arrow that says that way greater than 12,000. So that's the logical test. We are saying if cell F53, which is going to be our, oh, and it's gone to the wrong cell reference, which is useful. Always double check you've got the right cell reference, but the cell we want is actually F30, isn't it? I typed over it, so just be careful. Um, the net profit, if the net profit is greater than 12,000. If that's true, what did we want it to do? I think we said we wanted it to say, um, okay. If false, we wanted it to say, warning. Now I'm hopeful if I hit okay, 
it's going to say warning as if by magic. Now you can see what it's done in that cell actually for me is put in the complicated if formula, the if with then the open brackets F30 greater than 12,000, then the comma, then the speech box if true, okay, and then the comma speech marks if false warning. But don't you think using that functionality, insert function, is so much more straightforward? I would not really expect a student to memorize that whole if formula logical statement off the top of their head. Um, it's worked. It's worked that it says warning and we have got 7,100. So that is clearly less than 12,000. Now I'm just going to fudge it and say, for, for argument's sake, if I just manually type over in that profit and make it 13,000, we're hoping Haha, it's turned our if cell into OK because we're now back over. Just going to revert back over there. So I leave the right answer up on the screen. But there we go. That's that task concluded. Right, we've got one more task to go. Um, let's have a look at management account and costing. So management account and costing, we have got task three in this worksheet. It tells us Collie B sells a product, a Trevbu, for £500 each. The following cost information has been obtained for marking, or sorry, making one product, the Trevbu. So we've got some labour hours required and we've got a wages cost per hour. We've got some kilograms of material A and we've got the cost per kilogram. We've got some kilograms of material B and a cost per kilogram. We've got some direct overheads and we've also got some fixed overheads. Direct overheads, remember, are per unit. Fixed overheads, we need to know a method of absorption. And they've told us we need to allocate £10 for fixed overheads for every labour hour spent making a Trevbu. So in number one, it says insert rows below and prepare a cost card to show the absorbed cost of producing one unit. Include a heading underlining and in bold type. So first of all, I need to go and insert some rows. I am right clicking. I am selecting insert and then I'm hitting row. And I'm going to have to do that a few times to insert some more rows to give me enough space in this worksheet to do and present my cost card for the assessor. So I'll keep going. Doesn't hurt to insert a few more than I require. If you want to do that in a hurry, I was inserting one by one. If I now actually hold my mouse and highlight maybe four cells in one go and then go insert, right click again, entire row, it will actually replicate the number of cells I've got highlighted. So that's sped me up a bit. Right. Okay. We were asked to include a heading underlining bold type. Let's not submit something in the assessment without doing that. So we can just call it cost card. Didn't tell us what to call the heading. So cost card is fine. It said underline and bold type. So if I now select my cell that I've typed my heading in, it's already got bold, but I need to select underline. So I've gone to the home and then I'm just going to select the underline function. Could have also got that by right clicking and choosing the cell function. Um, um, I'm being asked by someone at home whether you will be given a pro forma. Quite often you're given a cell with some information, a, a spreadsheet with some information in, but then you'll be asked to create other bits. You'll be asked to insert some rows, insert some columns, insert some headings and stuff. So a bit of both really, a bit of both, but, but you will quite often have to present some stuff for yourself. So make sure you, you kind of just do what you think. If you don't quite understand, and I think sometimes students just get in a real flap in the assessment, not quite reading the requirement, don't worry, just crack on, do what you think and do something sensible, you will still get credit for it. It's much better to have a go, even if you've gone slightly off track, as long as that gets uploaded, I guarantee the assessors are on your side, they want to give you credit as much as they possibly can do within the constraints of the, the marking guides they've got. So here's our cost card. So a cost card, we would need to think about some direct costs, so direct costs, we look like we've got some labour. We also look like we've got some materials and it looks like we've got some materials. The good news for me, because I'm terrible at it, spelling won't be penalised, so don't worry. If you're asked to spell check, though, you should know where the spell check function is within Excel. Um, we've got materials of A and we've also got materials of Oh, if I could spell, not A again, B. 
So these are going to be our direct costs. This is where, again, we can show off a bit with our Excel functionality. Labour, to make one Trevbu, it's going to take 12 hours. And the wage cost per hour is £8. So for my labour cost card, I can just put in there equals the 12 hours required multiplied by the £8 per labour hour. We should get a cost card for one unit costing £96 in wages. We'll do something similar with materials now. Material A says it takes seven kilograms. I'm going to multiply that by the 18 quid a kilogram we've got there for material A. And that gives me a direct cost of one unit of £126 for material A. And then finally, material B in the same vein, I'm going to say my seven kilograms. No, sorry, two kilograms. This is where a bit of care needs to be taken at 40 pounds a kilogram is going to put through another 40 quid of direct cost there for material b we're also told about some direct overhead so our direct overhead is just going to be the 24 pounds that we have been told i'm maybe going to make that um with a bit of a, a function there a pound reference so hopefully I can either pop a pound sign there and it should realize what I want to do or I could have changed the functionality. And so that is my overhead. Just going to confirm that that's direct overhead. And then we've asked to show the absorbed cost. So that includes the element of fixed overhead as well. Fixed overhead, remember, will be absorbed at an absorption rate. And our overhead absorption rate is £10 per labour hour. So for our fixed overhead, I need to put in £10 multiplied by the number of labour hours. And so the labour hours is 12. At that point, I get 120. And so if I put a pound sign in front there, does it now produce it as a pound sign? No, it doesn't. But don't worry, I can show you another way to do that. If I just delete my pound sign reference, I've got the 120 quid. I can just right click and actually go in my functionality format cell. You'll be given a number option there. You can select currency. We haven't got any pennies on, but I do want to show a pound sign. So no decimal place, currency sign, a pound. And there we go, 120 quid. That means, hopefully, I can now tot up my cost card. So, in theory, the total cost, I can put this on my cost card, the total cost at that point. If I now, again, I can use our good friend, the sum function, sum up those numbers. I'm interested to know, if you've been playing along at home in the chat box, have you got um, a cost of... 446 quid is that what people have got just makes me feel a bit happier that i've not made a bit of a donut of myself this evening on a live broadcast getting it wrong fantastic thank you very much yeah i know i, I feel the pressure that you guys must feel in the exam when i'm doing it in front of an audience brilliant so that's the cost so insert the roads prepare the cost card i've done that i've got the the, the title in their cost card bold and underlined i'm going to get some credit for that Brilliant. Now, the second thing, and this is just a bit of a recap for you, if you are rusty on your management accounting costing. Um, we're going to need that in a minute, Nadia, or something similar, a profit per unit or not necessarily a profit. But that's what we're going to explore at this point. It says total fixed overheads are expected to be a hundred, sorry, 110,920 quid for the year. How many units of Trevbu need to be sold to break even? And then we've got a question mark in an answer box for the number of Trevbu. This is break even analysis or break even point. Now from break even point, hopefully you can remember from your studies, and I'm just going to show my workings underneath. We need to know the fixed cost. Well, we were told the fixed cost. The fixed cost is 110920. But the fixed cost goes at the top. We need to now divide through by, and not our profit per unit, Nadia, our contribution per 
unit. Now, if you remember your stuff from your costing studies, contribution per unit is selling price less direct costs. Now, this is where we need to go back up to our information. I told you right at the top of the screen, Collie B Limited sells the product for 500 quid each. So the selling price of 500, I need to now deduct my direct costs. Now my direct costs are actually only the direct costs I've got on display in the top bit of my cost card, the 96, the 126, the 80 and the 24. So I am going to put in there and I can use a sum formula again if I want to, or I could have just done equals plus, 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 plus. I don't mind how you do it, but your direct costs are only going to be £326, which means actually my contribution per unit is going to be my selling price of 500 so equals 500 minus my less direct costs of 326 I reckon we get a contribution per unit of £174. Again, can I just ask you to tell me in the chat box whether that is what you are getting at home or shout it out if you are watching the recording. Brilliant. That means at this point, I can now put in my contribution per unit. We've said that is 174 quid. So I've got that there. To work out my break even point, I now need to divide through. So if I divide through equals the 10920 divided by the contribution per unit, the maths works. I don't want that to be a pound sign though. I want that to be just a number of units. So I'm just going to change my formatting there. Format cells. I'm going to turn that into a simple number. Did we get 637 or 638, anybody? In the end, it doesn't really matter. I'd like to stress to you, in the synoptic exam, you've already proved yourself with your knowledge of advanced bookkeeping, final accounts, preparation, and management accounting costing. So not really there to catch you out on a technicality. If you've kind of followed the logic, it's more about demonstrating your Excel skills. So I, I am just going to... Um, hard to type in my answer. Um, I would actually say 638 for break even analysis. Everybody that's saying that in the chat box, we always round up because actually, if I only sold 637, I wouldn't quite cover it. So you always round up no matter what you get in break even analysis. So I've rounded up to 638 units. Are we happy with that, everybody? Has that been a useful recap of some of the stuff? Hasn't covered everything you need to know about spreadsheets. Can't possibly do that in one of these short sessions. But we've done about an hour, which is a nice study session. What I would like to do, one final thing before you disappear. Um, I'm hopefully going to be able to put the link in the chat box. I found on the AAT website today, and I don't know how I've missed it previously, a really, really, really nice link to a bit of a, a kind of article blog they've got. Hopefully in the chat box, I've just pasted it there. For the guys that I email the recordings to, I will also put it out there. But on the screen, I'm actually just going to share it with you. So anyone watching the recording can maybe just note it down and pause it. Wait one second, because I just need to do a new screen share with you. If I now share this screen, Hopefully, you can see a web page on the screen. And at the top here, you can see the web reference for it. If you Google it, it's fine. It's AAT Comment, a certain part of the AAT website, where they have given a really nice bit of instruction for common mistakes that students make in advanced level um, and the advanced synoptic. And one of the things I just wanted to stress as my closing thought for today and if anyone is doing their exam this week, just make sure you manage your time. Part one of the synoptic is the three tasks that, that cover ethics, as well as some of the, the prior knowledge of, of costing um, and bookkeeping and final accounts prep. 
the timer for that is different. You don't get the whole exam time to spread as you want. You get 75 minutes for those first three tasks. And once that 75 minutes is up or you click finish, the clock resets itself. So a big misconception students have had that I've taught in the past is I will rattle through the first bit because I need more time on the spreadsheets. That doesn't work. However long you spend on part one, when the time runs out or you hit finish, the clock resets and then you get the second part of the exam for the, the spreadsheets. Now you get 90 minutes. You also actually get 15 minutes to kind of get it uploaded, but you've got two spreadsheet tasks. I can't stress enough the importance of making sure you allocate time to get those two spreadsheet workbooks uploaded in the exam. And in that part of the exam, if, if you're at a first intuition center where I teach, you can call in the invigilator to help make sure it does get uploaded to the AAT. But it is vitally important that you do get both of your spreadsheets uploaded. If there is a part of one of the spreadsheets that you are struggling with, move on from that. It shouldn't stop you being able to complete any further requirements of that one. And for goodness sake, make sure you get something uploaded, a spreadsheet for both of those tasks, because there will be straightforward marks in both of them. And if you've got bogged down in something that might be more complicated in spreadsheet task one, having not uploaded anything for task two, you are dropping marks. Both of the spreadsheet tasks get uploaded at the end. So you don't need to do one and then upload it. They both get uploaded at the end. So the little caveat the AT have put on this, there is an asterisk there that says 90 minutes of time allowed. At the bottom of this link, it says you have actually got one hour, 45 minutes to complete section two, but they recommend you leave 15 minutes to get it uploaded. And I think that is vitally important because sadly, as students find out, if the spreadsheets don't get uploaded, they can't assess anything, you will fail and you have to wait to be told you failed. So you have to go through the pain of now waiting for your result. The result will not be out for this week until um, middle of, of end of August, which means you would now be looking at the September window for your, your reset. So please, 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 as my final thought for this evening, make sure you do get both of your spreadsheets uploaded, even if they are not complete. Okay, at that point, I am going to stop the recording and I am going to say good evening. Thank you for joining me.